Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number five, titled Resurrections Before the Cross. It's ready for teaching on October 29, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that as we come to open your word, we can ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us and to bless us and open our minds, keep our minds clear that we may understand what is here for us this week. We're looking at resurrections before the cross, and sometimes it's hard to get our mind around this. But as we put our trust in you, as we look into your word this week, we pray that not only will our hearts be opened, but our minds and our ability to share your love with those about us. And wherever people are, whether they're by themselves or with a family group or in a community of believers. Lord, I'd like to pray for each one. And particularly this week, I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Austria, in Europe, those who are listening in Jamaica and inter America, Winnipeg in Manitoba in Canada, Honiara in the Solomon Islands, Parks in Australia, Guam in the North Pacific, Auckland in New Zealand, Lusaka in Zambia, Lima in Peru, and those who are listening in Tokyo in Japan. Lord, we know there are people listening in all these countries. And as we not only listen, but concentrate and make ourselves receptive to the working of your Holy Spirit, we pray that this week may be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? This is from the LEB. That's John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? The Old Testament references to the resurrection that we have looked at so far were largely based on personal expectations. As we read in Job 19, 25-27, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And in Psalm 49, verse 15, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. And Psalm 71, verse 20, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. And on future promises as well, as we read in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 2, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And verse 13, But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest, and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. However, 
we also have the inspired records of cases in which people actually were raised from the dead. The first resurrection was of Moses, and we read about that in Jude 9 and Luke 9, verses 28 to 36, but we'll see those later in the week. During Israel's monarchy, the son of the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite son also were resurrected. We read about the son of the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings 17, verses 8 to 24. And the Shunammite woman in 2 Samuel chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, Christ, when here in the flesh, resurrected the son of the widow of Nain. And we read about that in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus also resurrected Jairus' daughter, which we read about in Luke chapter 8. And then there's the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Except for Moses, all these people were raised as mortals, who eventually would die again. These cases also confirm the biblical teaching of the unconsciousness of the dead, that we've read about in Job 3, verses 11 to 13. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breasts that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet, I would have been asleep, then I would have been at rest. And Psalm 115 verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Or Psalm 146 verse 4, his spirit departs, he returned to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. Or Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 10, with verse 5 reading, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And in verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. In none of these accounts, nor in any other biblical resurrection narratives, is there any mention of a supposed afterlife experience. This week, we will reflect more closely on the resurrections that occurred before Christ's own death and resurrection. Sunday, October 23, The Resurrection of Moses Read Jude 9 and Luke 9, 28-36. What evidences do you find in these texts for the bodily resurrection of Moses? First of all, Jude verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And Luke nine twenty eight to thirty six. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were fearful as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. Some Greek church fathers from Alexandria argued that when Moses died, two Moseses were seen, one alive in the spirit, 
another dead in the body. One Moses ascending to heaven with angels, the other buried in the earth. And that's recorded in Origen's Homilies on Joshua 2.1 by Clement of Alexandria in Stromata 6.15. This distinction between the assumption of the soul and the burial of the body might make sense to those who believe in the Greek concept of the immortal soul, but the idea is not in the Bible. Jude 9 confirms the biblical teaching of the resurrection of Moses' body because the dispute was about the body of Moses and not about any supposed surviving soul. Deuteronomy 34, 5-7 tells us that Moses died at 120 years of age and the Lord buried him in a hidden place in a valley in the land of Moab. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 34, beginning at verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigour diminished. But Moses did not remain for very long in the grave, as we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 478 and 479. Christ himself, with the angels who had buried Moses, came down from heaven to call forth the sleeping saint. For the first time, Christ was about to give life to the dead, as the Prince of Life and the Shining Ones approached the grave. Satan was alarmed for his supremacy. Christ did not stoop to enter into controversy with Satan, but Christ referred all to his Father, saying, The Lord rebuke you. In Jude 9, the resurrection was forever made certain. Satan was despoiled of his prey. The righteous dead would live again. End of quote. A clear evidence of Moses' resurrection is found in the Transfiguration. There, Moses appeared with the prophet Elijah, who had been translated without seeing death, as we read in Second Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And it came to pass, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. The fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not... It shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. 
and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Moses and Elijah even dialogued with Jesus, and we read about that yesterday in Luke chapter 9. Verse 30 and 31 read, And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses' appearance, proof of Christ's coming victory over sin and death, is depicted here in unmistakable terms. It was Moses and Elijah, not their spirits. After all, Elijah hadn't died, who had appeared to Jesus there. And so to finish today, Moses was not allowed to enter the earthly Canaan. We read about that in Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 to 4. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. But Moses was taken away into the heavenly Canaan. What does this teach us about how God, as it says in Ephesians 3.20, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us? Monday, October 24, Two Old Testament Cases Read 1 Kings 17, 8-24 and 2 Kings 4, 18-37. What similarities and differences do you see in these two resurrections? First of all, Elijah and the widow, 1 Kings 17, beginning at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son." For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. Now, It happened that after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? 
And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. And Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, My head, my head. So he said to a servant, Carry me to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Now, when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and has not told me. So she said, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready, and take my staff in your hand, and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him, and if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them, and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house, and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read that, By faith, women received back their dead by resurrection, in Hebrews 11.35. This was the case in the two resurrections depicted in the text for today. The first one, in 1 Kings 17, occurred during the great apostasy in Israel, which happened under the influence of King Ahab and his pagan wife Jezebel. As a severe drought was ravaging the land, God commanded Elijah to go to Zarephath, a town outside of Israel. There he met a poor Phoenician widow who was about to cook a paltry last meal for herself and her son, and then die. But, their lives were spared through the miracle of the flour and the oil, which didn't run out until the drought was over. Some time later, her son became sick and died. In despair, the mother pled with Elijah, who cried out to the Lord. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the boy returned to him, and he revived, in verse 22. The second resurrection in 2 Kings chapter 4 
took place in Shunem, a small village south of Mount Gilboa. Elisha had helped the poor widow to pay her debts through the miracle of filling many vessels with oil. Later, in Shunem, he met a prominent married woman who had no children. The prophet told her that she would have a son, and it happened as predicted. The child grew and was healthy, but one day got sick and died. The Shunammite woman went to Mount Carmel and asked Elisha to come with her to see her son. Elisha prayed persistently to the Lord, and finally the child was alive again. These women had different backgrounds, but the same saving faith. The Phoenician widow hosted the prophet Elijah in an extremely difficult time when there was no safe place for him in Israel. The Shunammite woman and her husband built a special room where the prophet Elijah could stay while passing through their region. When the two children died, their faithful mothers appealed to those prophets of God and had the joy of seeing their children come to life again. And so to finish the day... These are great stories, but for each of these two accounts, how many untold others didn't end with something so miraculous? What should this sad fact teach us about just how central to our faith is the promised resurrection at the end of time? Tuesday, October 25, the son of the widow of Nain. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Indeed, all the Gospels are full of accounts of Jesus ministering to many needy and hurting souls, which is why later many Jews came to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. In Steps to Christ, pages 11 and 12, we read, There were whole villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house, for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. His work gave evidence of his divine anointing. Love, mercy and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out in tender sympathy to the children of men. He took man's nature that he might reach man's wants. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. End of quote. Read Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 17. What important difference is there between what happened in this resurrection and in the ones we looked at yesterday? Luke 7, beginning at verse 11, Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then... He came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea, and all the surrounding regions. During his ministry in Galilee, Jesus healed the sick and expelled demons. One time, he and his followers were approaching the gates of Nain when a funeral procession was going through those gates. In the open coffin was the only son of a widow, who was weeping inconsolably. Full of compassion for the grieving mother, Jesus said to her, Do not weep. Then Jesus turned to the dead son in the coffin and ordered him, Young man, I say to you, arise. The son came to life, and Jesus presented him to his mother, as we read in Luke 7, 13-15. 
The presence of Jesus completely changed the whole scenario, and many people who had witnessed the miracle knew not only that something astonishing had happened, but also that someone special, they called him a great prophet, was among them. Both the Phoenician widow in 1 Kings 17 and the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 had asked for help from Elijah and Elisha respectively. But the widow of Nain was helped without even asking for it. This means that God cares for us even when we are unable or feel unworthy to ask him for help. Jesus saw the problem and dealt with it. So typical of Jesus through all his ministry. And so to finish the day, true religion involves caring for orphans and widows around us, as we read in James 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Though obviously we won't be able to do the kind of miracles Jesus did, what can we do to minister to those who are hurting around us? Wednesday, October 26, Jairus' daughter. The resurrections prior to Jesus' own death and resurrection were not limited to any specific ethnic group or social class. Moses was perhaps the greatest human leader of God's people ever. We read that in Deuteronomy 34, verses 10 to 12. But since then, there has not risen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land, and by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. By contrast, the poor Phoenician widow was not even an Israelite, as we read in 1 Kings 17 verse 9. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. The Shunammite woman was prominent in her community in 2 Kings 4 verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by he would turn in there to eat some food. The widow of Nain had only one son upon whom she was probably dependent, we read in Luke 7.12. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. In contrast, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue, probably in Capernaum, as you read in Mark 5.22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Regardless of their different cultural backgrounds or social status, all of them were blessed by God's life-giving power. Read Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, and verses 35 to 43. What can we learn about death from Christ's words, The child is not dead, but sleeping, in verse 39. Let's begin Mark 5 at verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him, and thronged him. And then to verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. 
and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he went to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was laying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given to her to eat. Jairus' twelve-year-old daughter was lying deathly sick at home. So he went to Jesus and begged him to come to his home and lay his healing hands on her. But before they could get there, someone already brought the sad news, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Then Jesus said to the grieving father, Do not fear, only believe. Indeed, all the father could do was totally trust in God's intervention. Arriving at the house, Jesus said to those who gathered there, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They ridiculed him because, one, they knew that she was dead, and two, they did not grasp the meaning of his words. We read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 609, the comforting metaphor by which sleep stands for death seems to have been Christ's favourite way of referring to this experience. Death is a sleep, but it is a deep sleep from which only the great life-giver can awaken one, for he alone has the keys to the tomb. End of quote. After the resurrection of this girl, those who saw it were overcome with amazement in Mark 5.42. No wonder, for now, death is final, absolute, and seemingly irreversible. To have seen something like this with their own eyes surely must have been an amazing, life-changing experience. And so to finish today, Jesus' words, Do not fear, only believe, in Mark 5.36, are still meaningful for us today. How can we learn to do that even amid fearful situations, which are the most important times to keep believing? Thursday, October 27. Lazarus. Read John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. In what sense was Jesus glorified by the sickness and death of Lazarus, as expressed in verse 4? John 11, beginning at verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you loved is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but by the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. 
Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews, who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him! and let him go. Here too, Jesus uses the metaphor for sleep in talking about death. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up, in verse 11. When some thought he was talking about literal sleep, in verses 11 to 13, Jesus clearly stated what he meant. Lazarus is dead. Actually, when Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had been dead four days. His corpse already was rotting, as we read in verse 39. By the time a body starts decomposing badly enough to smell, there's no question, the person is dead. In this context, when Jesus told Martha, your brother will rise from the dead, in verse 23, she reaffirmed her belief in the final resurrection. But Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? And that's from verses 23 to 26. And Jesus added, If you believe, you will see the glory of God. 
Martha believed and she saw the glory of God in the resurrection of her brother. The Bible says that by God's word life was created in Genesis 1, 20 to 30 and in Psalm 33 verse 6. Let's look at Genesis 1 beginning at verse 20 again. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, Fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life." I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And then in Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And by his word life can be recreated, as in the case of Lazarus. After a short prayer, Jesus ordered, Lazarus, come forth in verse 43. Right then and there, these people saw the life-giving power of God, the same power that spoke our world into existence, and the same power that at the end of the age will call the dead back to life in the resurrection. By raising Lazarus, Jesus proved that he had the power to defeat death, which, for beings like us, who inevitably die, what greater manifestation of God's glory could there be? And so to finish today... Read John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. In one line, Jesus talks about believers dying, and in the next, he talks about believers never dying. What is Jesus teaching us here, and why is the understanding that death is an unconscious sleep so crucial in understanding Christ's words? And why do his words offer us, as beings destined to the grave, so much hope? Let's read those two verses, John eleven twenty five and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Friday, October 28. In The Desire of Ages, page 530, we read, In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5.12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believeth in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Christ here, in John eleven twenty five and 26, looks forward to the time of his second coming. Then the righteous dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the living righteous shall be translated to heaven without seeing death. 
The miracle which Christ was about to perform in raising Lazarus from the dead would represent the resurrection of all the righteous dead. By his word and his works he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He, who himself was soon to die upon the cross, stood with the keys of death, a conqueror at the grave, and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Many people died during the prophetic ministries of Elijah and Elisha, as well as during Christ's own earthly ministry. Only a few were resurrected. And we're referred here to Luke 4, verses 24 to 27. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Thinking, too, about the experience of all the dead, whether resurrected in the past or at the second coming, what difference does it make, at least in regard to what it was like to be dead? Two, many writers over the centuries have written about the futility of a life that ends always in death. Along with other living creatures, chickens, beavers, oysters, etc., we all die. However, for humans, in a sense, our predicament is worse than for the animals because we know that we are going to die. As we read in Ecclesiastes 9.5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Chickens, beavers and oysters don't. Why, then, is the promise of the resurrection so crucial to us? And question three, if you think that the soul is immortal and that the dead, especially the righteous dead, live on in heaven after they die, what need is there for the resurrection at the end of time? And four, if someone called and asked, Is Sally there? You might answer, Yes, but she's sleeping. If, however, someone called and asked, Is Sally there? You are not going to answer, Yes, but she's dead. Why not? What does this teach us about the nature of death? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Christ's Ambassador by Benji Leach One of my goals as chaplain of Forest Lake Academy in Orlando, Florida, was to become acquainted with each student. It was a challenge in a school with 450 students in the mid-1970s. At the beginning of the school year, a student came up to me and asked, Have you had a chance to become acquainted with Paul yet? I had not. You need to get acquainted, the student said. Just asked where he is from. My curiosity was aroused, so I invited Paul to my office. He turned out to be a rather shy 16-year-old. So, Paul, I asked, where are you from? I'm from a little town in Georgia called Plains, he said. My mouth dropped open. What? I said. That is where the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, lives. I had to ask. Paul, I said. Do you know the president? Oh, yes, he said. Early that summer, he had needed a job to pay for his tuition at Forest Lake Academy, and he had gotten a job at a peanut warehouse, the main industry in Plains. He was excited about finding work and thought that he had made it clear about taking Sabbaths off. But his work supervisor stopped him when he left on Friday, with a promise to return on Monday. No, the supervisor said. You come tomorrow. We are open Saturday. But you see, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, Paul said. Come tomorrow or you won't have a job anymore, the supervisor said. Paul thought for a moment. Can I speak to the owner? But that's the president, the supervisor exclaimed. Is he in town, Paul asked. Yes, but I don't think that it's going to make any difference. 
Paul went to the Carter home. He had to go through the Secret Service, but he was able to sit down with the President. Jimmy Carter listened attentively as he explained the situation and his observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. I respect any young person who has the convictions and stands up for what he believes, the President said. You can have your Sabbaths off. And the soft-spoken 16-year-old teen became Christ's ambassador to the US President. You and I also are ambassadors for Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, says 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Let us, with Christ's help, be faithful ambassadors. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.